then we are very happy to have a token cell from Institute for Advanced Study, and this token will be about now these child operators. Let's welcome him. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about a project I work with uh, Ying Shen Ling, who used to be a student at Harvard too, and he's now a postdoc at Caltech. And uh, this talk will have some overlap with uh, another version of this talk that I gave in April at Harvard. So um, the, there will be something slightly new in the second half of the talk. So I hope um, people who, have, who, who was there, who, who were there in April, might still find it interesting. And the talk will be based on a paper I wrote with Ying in April. And if time permits, I will also mention some work in progress. Okay. So um, the starting point of the project is that there are two major non-perturbative tools that we use in quantum field theory. Uh, the first one is the Kahoot anomaly. The Kahoot anomaly of the global symmetry is an obstruction to gauging the global symmetry. And this obstruction is something robust under RG flow, and it should be matched under RG and should be matched in any proposed duality. The second tool is the conformal bootstrap, is to exploit the internal consistency of CFT to, the, to constrain the operator spec. Now, um, the, the starting motivation of this work is just uh, we would like to combine these two techniques together and see what new things we can find. The question we would like to ask is that in a general CFT with some global symmetry G and an anomaly and a Kahoot anomaly alpha, is there an upper bound on the lightest G charged local operator? And if there is such a bound, how does the bound depend on the Kahoot anomaly of the global symmetry G? This question is uh, posed in the CFT, but it sounds like a weak gravity question. Uh, uh, in ADS, and it will be related, as we will see. But for the bold part of the talk, I'm going to just focus on the CFD side and try to make concrete CFD statement. And I think the simplest possible setup would be in 1 plus 1D to consider a bosonic CFD, so we don't need a choice of the spin structure, and set the global symmetry to be just Z. It's probably the simplest set. Yeah. Okay. yeah, that takes for you. Oh, okay. And the question in this particular case would be, is there an upper bound on the lightest Z2 odd offer? And let me show you the result first. The result is that you only have an upper bound on the lightest Z2 odd operator if the Z2 symmetry is anomalous. On the other hand, when the Z2 is non anomalous, there's not going to be an upper bound on the lightest e to the top. The moral of the story is that it's harder to hide a symmetry if it is anomalous. When the Z2 is anomalous, then it must imply that there, there are some light local operators that are G2R. You cannot hide all your Z2R the operator into the uh, So here's a quick reminder on the Hoop anomalies. So throughout this talk, whenever I say anomaly, it's always going to be about the Hoop anomaly. The Hoop anomaly uh, is a, a global symmetry with the Hoop anomaly. It's still a perfectly healthy symmetry in a consistent form of the There's just an obstruction to gauging. This is to be contrasted with the ABJ anomaly, where there's a classical axial quote-unquote symmetry that fails to be a true global symmetry quantum mechanical. In that case, you just do not have this global symmetry, and then the dis discussion will not be about global symmetry at all. This is also to be contrasted with the gauge anomaly, where if you have a gauge anomaly, that means the quantum field theory itself is just inconsistent, and there's nothing to talk about. So you mean J to J is check here? Yeah. Adler, they all Actually, Richard asked me, I, because I told him before, yes. Jack, he wrote a paper on the Trent Simons uh, uh, anomaly uh, in 1973 or 72. Yeah? 
Yeah. I'm going to find a paper. Yeah, I'll do that. If you can okay. find it, let me know. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, so, yeah, so here I just want to make it clear that throughout the talk, I'm only going to talk about the phenomenon. The global symmetry is healthy, the quantum field theory is also healthy. So the outline of the talk is the following. So we start with a discussion about symmetry and anomaly in 1 plus 1D. The description will be complete, completely general and abstract and does not rely on the existence of a Lagrangian. Given such a general abstract description, we can then input uh, the information of the Hoop anomaly and global symmetry into the modular bootstrap program. That will be the second part of the story. And the third part will be about some implications for the weak gravity conjecture. Uh, so I'm not going to say too much. And the fourth part will be comments on more general to group anomalies that cannot be matched by PUFD. So we start with the first part. So how, how do we think about global symmetry in quantum uh, field theory? If I have a Lagrangian and I have some explicit uh, symmetry transformation on the Lagrangian field, then I can follow the inertia procedure to first get an inertia current and then integrate the current on some co-dimensional one uh, radical space time to get an inertia part. This is for continuous global symmetry in a Lagrangian field theory. That's not generally enough. In particular, if we want to talk about discrete symmetry, such as the topic of talk today, then we don't we don't we do not even have the inertia current in the intermediate step. But by saying that there is a symmetry, of course we need a charge operator at the end of the day. But we do need an inertia charge. So the abstract way to characterize the existence of a symmetry is that there has to be uh, a co-dimensional one topological defect uh, yeah, for each two element of the symmetry. So let me decode uh, all these uh, words for a little bit. So saying that it's called co-dimension one uh, is, is, it follows from the fact that the usual inertia procedure, you integrate the inertia current at a fixed time, for example. And the, fi the, space, the space at a fixed time is a co-dimension one time. So you should think about a charge operator as some kind of feedback operator which has support on the co-dimension one manifold or space time. The word topological uh, follows from the fact that in the continuous case, the inertia current is conserved. So when you deform your locus of this co-dimension one manifold, you do not change any partition function. An abstract way to think about this inertia charge is that it's a defect that is topological and is supported on a co-dimension one manifold in your space time. The topological defects, they should obey the fusion algebra of your symmetry group. And it should act on local operator by, by the symmetry transformation. So we will going to be in 1 plus 1D uh, for, uh, for, for today's talk. So a co-dimensional one manifold in 1 plus 1D will be a line. And let's say this is the is topological line space line. Uh, the line is top line or space so line? Here, I, uh, uh, so most of the discussion will be in Euclidean two manifold. So I will generally not distinguish time with space. Although in the modular bootstrap part, I, that, that, that distinction could be important. But for this plot, it is a Euclidean two manifold. And I'm just drawing a line in this Euclidean two manifold. Um, and so this is the topological line for some D2 global symmetry. And this is a point operator that may or may not be charged under the Z2. The line is topological, so that means if I move the line a little bit around, that's not going to change any correlation function. On the other hand, if I move the topological line past the local operator, then I pick up the Z2 charge of this local operator top. So that's how the topological defect uh, act on local operator. <coughs> so just to recap, given any zero-point global symmetry in your quantum field theory, and for every group element of the global symmetry G, there's an associated topological defect that's supported on the co-dimensional one manifold in your space-time. 
The converse error is actually not true. There are topological, there are co-dimensional and topological defects that are not associated with any global symmetry. But that would be another topic. So now let me say some basic properties of the topological lines in 2D, in 1 plus 1D. These are not going to be all the basic properties, but just some selected points that will be relevant for today's talk. So the basic fact is that they are topological, as the name suggests. In particular, that means they commute with the stress tensor in your 1 plus 1D quantum field theory. And that further more implies that they commute with both the left and the right moving pair of zero and Given that fact, you can uh, construct a, a different Hilbert space than the usual one. So this is a cylinder, and this red circle is taken to be the space. So you quantize your quantum field theory on this S1 space. Uh, but um, here I put an additional topological defect line, L, such that it intersects with the space at a single point. The intersection modifies the quantization. In the case when the topological line is a D2 line, that means instead of having periodic boundary condition for my field, now a D2 even field will still be periodic, but for a D2 odd field, it will be anti-periodic because as it travels around the S1, it gets acted upon by the D2 line. So this is a twisted boundary condition for your quantization. Because of the twist, the new Hilbert space you get in this quantization will be different from the ordinary Hilbert space of local operators. So this new Hilbert space will be denoted as H sub L. It's, it's, uh, the contents of the state in H sub L will depend on the choice of your topological line L. And of course, it depends on the field theory. One important fact about the topological line is that it commutes with both the Virasura, with both the left and the right moving Virasura algebra. And therefore, this H sub L Hilbert space can be decomposed into representations of both Virasura algebra. And to be a consistent Hilbert space, you need the degeneracy N sub L for each Virasura representation to be a, a positive integer. And that's actually a very strong constraint on what possible topological defect you can have in a 1 plus 1 D quantum field theory. I will loosely call this H sub L as the twisted sector, because it's a Hilbert space that's twisted by its topological defect. So what are the states in the twisted sector? Suppose I prepare a state mu in this twisted sector, then I can do the operators stage map to go from a cylinder to a complex plane. Under the operator state map, the spatial S1 is shrunk to a point, this red point on the left. The defect is mapped uh, to, to there. So you can see that a state in the twisted sector is now mapped to a point-like operator living at the end of the topological line L. So this point-like operator, mu of x, is not a local operator in my terminology because it has a string attached. But it's a point-like operator. So this is the operator state map for the twisted sector. The state in the twisted sector is in one-to-one -one correspondence with a point-like operator living at the end of the defect line. So this is this non-local operator, mu of x, is not something too fancy. We actually encounter such uh, point-like operator already in QED. The electron in QED is not a gauge invariant operator, so therefore it cannot exist in isolation. But the correct way to think about electron is that it's attached to a Wilson one. The Wilson line is not topological. The Wilson line is not topological, so the analogy stops there. <laughs> Although in some cases the Wilson line will be topological, but not in QED. Okay. So, so far, everything I say is just about um, uh, Z2 symmetry in 1 plus 1 D e quantum field theory. And everything I say is true for an anomalous Z2 or a non anomalous Z2. So, we haven't seen the input of the anomaly into the description. 
So how does anomaly come about in this abstract description in terms of the, uh, in terms of the topological defect line? So as it turns out, the anomaly comes in uh, through a certain crossing relation of the Z2 topological defect line. So let's imagine we want to compute some Euclidean partition function of our 1 plus 1 e from the field theory on some hierogenous Riemann surface. And on the Riemann surface, we insert various local operators as well as various topological defect lines. For well-defined 1 plus 1 default the field theory, there's an unambiguous function that you get for this partition function. Now imagine that on the Riemann surface, there's a small little local patch that's shown in, by this gray circle such that in the patch, there are only two topological, there are only two Z2 topological lines going in this direction, and nothing else. Um, the disk, the, the, the local patch has a local, uh, locally has a topology of the disk. And now let's imagine we do a little surgery in, inside this local patch. So we're going to cut out this local patch and replace this configuration by the right. You'll see that doing this little surgery does nothing to the uh, configuration outside the patch. So we're not changing anything outside the patch, but just doing this little replacement in this little, little patch of the topology list. So now you can ask, we have, on the left we have one partition function, on the left, we have another partition function with this local patch replaced by another configuration. What's, what are, what's the relation between these two partition functions? You can argue that the difference has to be at most a number that's shown in alpha. The way to argue that is that you can, uh, by cutting out this little disk, you are preparing a state in this Hilbert space. So this Hilbert space has four Z2 defect line inserted. So uh, it's going to be isomorphic to the Hilbert space uh, of your local operator. Now if I further assume my 1 plus 1 default field theory has a unique uh, identity operator, then the Hilbert space for such a state is one dimension. And therefore we are preparing two line linearly dependent states on the left versus on the right. And therefore they can at most differ by a constant. Now, what can this alpha be? Well, that's easy. You just apply the same rule on the right again, and then you return to the original configuration on the left. So you learn that alpha has to square root of one. And here I claim when alpha is plus one, that means the Z2 symmetry is not about this. When alpha is minus one, that means the Z2 symmetry is not about this. And in, in fact, this alpha is nothing but uh, a third group cohomology of V2 with V1 coefficient, and that formally classifies all the uh, Z2 anomaly in the 1 plus 1 D bosonic QFD. Here's the claim, and let's try to justify it. One way to justify it is that, suppose you don't care about whether alpha is plus 1 or minus 1. So get a 1 plus 1 D quantum field theory, there's a Z2 symmetry, let's just go ahead and gauge it. Now I want to compute the torus partition function of the D2 gauged theory. The torus partition function can be written in terms of four terms of the or original ungaged theory. Uh, so the square here is supposed to represent the torus, where this side and this side are identified, and this side and this side are identified. The first two terms can be interpreted as the contribution from the untwisted sector in the original theory. But it's not all the operators in the untwisted sector. We're summing two terms where this term involves a Z2 line at a fixed time. At a fixed time, this Z2 line just represents the usual Z2 action on your original Hilbert space of local operators. So this, the first two terms uh, uh, <coughs> corresponds to the projection to the Z2 even local operators of the origin. That's the first thing you do in any kind of gauge. You look at your list of operators and you keep the invariant ones. 
1 plus 1D, there's a second thing you would have to do, which is to introduce two C sector operators, which are local operators. They're engaging a zero form global symmetry in 1 plus 1D. So we, as we were saying before, if you have a topological line at the fixed space, but extended along the time, that will modify stochronization and give you the twisted sector. But again, we are not supposed to include all states from the twisted sector. We should only include those states that are z to even in the twisted sector. So you are tempted to do another projection also in the twisted sector. But then there's a diagram that looks problematic, namely this one. This one has a cross, and you have to make sense of what that cross means. There are two possible ways to interpret the cross. It could either be this one or that one. However, the two differ by an alpha. So when alpha is plus one, there's no ambiguity in interpreting what that cross means. But when alpha is minus one, there's ambiguity. And two different resolutions give you a different answer, and you do not have a consistent way to project to a subsector in the twisted sector, such that you can modulate the So that's one way to see the obstruction to gauging a Z2 symmetry when this alpha is minus one. Another uh, easier way to see that is just that when you go from the left to the right, you are doing a local Z2 gauge transformation in this little patch, and in the presence of some Z2 background. If, if your partition function uh, get an anomalous space uh, under the Gate transformation in the presence of background field, that's the whole mark of This is just a recap that uh, there's a crossing relation of the topological line. When alpha is plus one, that means the line has no Tobuf anomaly and can be gauged. When alpha is minus one, that means there's a Tobuf anomaly and the D2 cannot be gauged. But that concludes the abstract des description or characterization of the Z2 symmetry in 1 plus 1D from the field theory and this anomaly. Now we're going to move on to the second part where we combine with the module bootstrap. So as usual in any bootstrap program, there are two ingredients that are necessary. The first one is that you have to have a positive function. You have to have some functions that when you expand it on certain uh, basic <coughs> function, they have positive in the case of usual four-point function couple of bootstrap, you have to start with the four-point function. Oh, yeah. Question on the previous part? Yeah. So if I have an anomalous uh, Z2 theory, and I want to compute partition function, say, on a sphere or a torus with some number of uh, ins you know, defect insertions, is that a well-defined thing or not? Yes, uh, that's a well-defined thing. Because when you, that just corresponds to doing uh, some path integral for the 1 plus 1D quantum field theory with some Z2 background. As long as you don't sum over the background, there's nothing wrong with it. So in, in, this, in this discussion, it's important to distinguish what uh, gauge field configurations are background and what are dynamical. So when I draw those Z2 lines, that those represent background Z2 gauge field configurations. Those are fixed backgrounds. And there's nothing wrong with that. However, when you attempt to sum over it, such as in the case here, then you run into trouble as interpreting it as a partition function for the integer. Am I allowed to like shrink, uh, say, a loop to, to a point yeah. and, and, and throw it out? Is that, is, is that? You, for the anomalous V2 case, when you do that process, you might get some sign or basis. That's a very subtle phenomenon. It's actually discussing my paper with E5 and G, G, B, and E. But that's very interesting, but uh, in this talk, I will not talk about that at all. Space. So there's a well defined answer for the partition function uh, uh, with arbitrary uh, topological line coming. So you're just not allowed to like get rid of closed loops or something like that? Get rid of what? You're, you're not allowed to, to kind of make singular, like shrinking something to a point is kind of, and is considered a singular deformation. No, that's that's a lot. That's a lot. You can you can on a on a plan say I have a topological line. That's that's a circle. I can shrink it, and uh, as you can tell, when you shrink it, 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 it when it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, um, uh, it, 
it becomes more and more like a local operator. But the topological line doesn't carry any conformal weight, so it can only be proportional to the identity operator. But there might be a constant in front of that identity operator, and that's an interesting constant. It's not ill-defined, but it's an interesting uh, uh, number, and you are totally allowed to shrink a topological line. For group actions, that constant's always one. So depends how you frame it, right? There's no framing in one plus one. Well, there, there should be co orientations in one. So this is for C2. Uh -huh. Also, <laughs> I think that's one way to say it. Indeed. But in the current, I think there are two ways to say it. The first way is to, is to assign artificial framing or orientation. Mm -hmm. And the second way to say, say it is that there's a, uh, there's a gravitational, there's a mixed gravitational anomaly between the V2 and, and, and gravity. Mm -hmm. And therefore, as actually when you put the topological line on a curved manifold and you deform the locus of the line, you might get some things. This, act, this is actually related to the space science of Yeah. So <laughs> when you have a V2 anomaly, then there's this anomalous space as you can the current manifold. And that anomalous space actually tells you that the war line of mechanics on the D2 line has a time reversal anomaly. The way you understand the time reversal anomaly is because, as you say, there's an orientation on the D2 line, even though it's in D2. And the relation between D2 anomaly in D plus 1 dimension and the time reversal anomaly in D dimension is this misanthropy. So this is a physical way to realize the Smith isomorphism between the two cohorts and group in this particular context. So we were talking about the ingredients in any module but in any bootstrap program. So the first one is to have a positive function. The usual four-point function of a bootstrap, you start with the four-point function, and you can decompose it onto the conformal blocks. And the coefficients are the OPE coefficient squared, which in the unitary theory have to be positive, positive. In the current case, we will be bootstrapping the torus partition function. And the torus partition functions can be expanded onto the Virasoro characters. And the coefficients are now the degeneracy of the state in that Virasoro representation. The degeneracies in the non state theory has to be positive. That's the first ingredient. The second ingredient is that there has to be some crossing relation. Notice that this crossing is not directly the crossing of the topological lines that we just discussed. This cross, the crossing here I'm referring to is the modular S transformation of the torus partition function. In the usual four-point function bootstrap, the crossing is the equivalence of the S channel and the T channel component. Now I'm going to um, spell it out these two ingredients in the context that. So starting from the easiest one is the torus partition function without any topological defect line. So there you uh, you can compute the torus partition function as the function of the a complex structure moduli of the torus, denoted as tau and tau bar. The torus partition function can be interpreted as a trace over the Hilbert space of local operators. And since the, uh, the theory has the Virasoro, well, here I'm assuming that I'm talking about 1 plus 1 DCFT. So in the CFT, we have the Virasoro times Virasoro symmetry, and I can expand the torus partition functions onto the uh, uh, Virasoro characters with positive coefficient. I'm going to assume the central charge is greater than 1, because when the central charge is smaller or equals 1, we the central charge is smaller than 1, we have classified all the uh, unitary conformal field theory. When the central charge is equal to 1, there's a proposed classification for all the unitary CFD. So I will regard this <coughs> less or equals to 1 CFD as the boring ones, because there's a finite list of them, and you can just go through the list and study everything you want to know. Whereas when C is greater than 1, we don't know the full landscape of 1 plus 1 D CFD, and that would be the uh, subject of interest here. And when C is greater than 1, then the Virasoro character is given by this simple function. 
q is e to the 2 pi i tau. Eta, eta is the dedicated. So you have a torus partition function that has to be expandable on um, the there are several characters with positive coefficients. So that's the first positive function that we <coughs> The second one is to insert the Z2 topological defects at a fixed time. So that just represents the usual Z2 charge action on your Hilbert space of local operators. So this partition function, which will be denoted as Z, is a superscript. L has a trace interpretation as trace over the Hilbert space of the same Hilbert space of local operators, <coughs> but with a Z2 charge action. So um, the coefficients here, uh, the Z2 even operator will contribute with a plus sign, whereas the Z2 odd operator will contribute with a minus sign. So this partition function is not positive, but of course you can just take the sum and difference of the previous one with this one and get two positive. The third one is the twisted sector torus partition function, where you insert the line this way, such that you modify your quantization. And therefore, we're talking about a different Hilbert space. And, in, and this partition function will be denoted as Z sub L, and it has a trace interpretation over a different Hilbert space, again with positive coefficients. So we have so far obtained three positive torus partition functions. That's the first ingredient of any bootstrap. So let's try to uh, learn a little bit more about the about one of them, the Z, the twisted sector partition function, this guy. Um, so we start with the, the twisted sector partition function. We can apply a T transformation of the SL2Z and a T inverse transformation on it, and we get this to uh, a diagram. The, the two, again, differ exactly by a crossing relation of the Z2 topological line. So we know the two would have to differ by this alpha. Therefore, we learned that Z sub L is invariant under T squared if alpha is plus one. But it gets a minus sign under T squared uh, when alpha is minus one. So it's only invariant under T to the fourth. Recall that for Torus partition function without any topological defect line uh, insertion, it has to be invariant under the full SL2Z modular transformation. And in particular, it is invariant under the T transformation. And that just means that in a bosonic 1 plus 1 DCFT, all the local operators have integer spin. Because T transformation uh, detects the spin of the operator to our company. The twisted sector partition function is Z sub L. The situation is different. It's not invariant under T. And when it's non anomalous, in this case, it's invariant under T squared. But when it's anomalous, it's only invariant under T to the fourth. So this leads to a spin selection rule in the twisted sector. So we would like to understand what are the Lorentz spin S and lead the difference between H. R in the twisted sector. Or here I call it feedback in this case. Um, and the, as in the analysis on the previous page, this spin is, is constrained by the anomaly. So when it's non anomalous, the spin can be integer or a half integer. When the Z2 is anomalous, then it could only be one quarter plus an integer or a half integer. This is another way to see that when the Z2 is anomalous, you cannot possibly gauge the Z2 symmetry. Because when Z2 is anomalous, all the spins in the twisted sectors are non-integers. But the rule of, again, engaging global symmetry in 2D, in 1 plus 1D, is that you have to introduce new guys from the twisted sector. So when the Z2 is anomalous, there's no candidate new guys that can be introduced. Whereas in the non-anomalous case, we have half of them have integer spin, and the other half have half integer spin. And, the, and, and when you do the Z2 multiple, you exactly introduce the integer spin operators from the twisted sector to the local operator spectrum of your new thing. There's another way to understand the, 
the, the spin here. So this one quarter, let's start with the anomalous case. The one quarter here might look familiar to people who are uh, who, who think a lot about the two plus one b e to the p. So a different way to write this expression is that the spin can be one quarter <coughs> plus the integer or minus one quarter plus the integer. And one quarter and minus one quarter are the spins of the semion and the anti-semion in the twisted diagram this is not a coincidence because you can start with a 1 plus 1d quantum field theory with an anomalous d2 global symmetry and couple it to the non trivial d2 spt in the 2 plus 1d fork. And then you make the d2 gauge field dynamical. You can only make the d2 gauge field dynamical with this coupling to the fork because in isolation, the 1 plus 1d quantum field theory has an anomalous d2 symmetry. When you make that uh, d2 dynamical, then the twisted sector of the original 1 plus 1D quantum field theory, they split. Half of them become the endpoints of the semion, and the other half becomes the endpoints of the anti semion. There's a change of basis between the twisted sector to the anion basis when you couple to the 2 plus 1D. Similarly here, um, some of the lines have integer spin, and these, some others have one, one half plus integer. And the integer spins one will, uh, will be will, will, will be the endpoint of the magnetic line Tori code, and the half integer spin one will be the endpoints of the fermion line Tori code in the non state. Okay, so uh, these are the ingredients of the, the code. So this is the crossing relation that uh, you, you can. For the ordinary torus partition function, they just go to each other under the modular S transformation. Uh, and for the twisted sector partition function, when you do S, it becomes a torus partition function, but with a Z2 charge operator inserted at a fixed time. And the way that the anomaly enters into the whole story is that the spins in the twisted sector depend on the anomaly, as in the previous slide. So then, these are everything we need to do comparable bootstrap. We have three po positive part uh, pos partition functions, and we have some crossing relations relating them. And the anomalies enter into the uh, 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 story uh, through the spin of the twisted cycle. And this is the result I showed earlier that, um, so, with this bootstrap system, you can try to bound various things. You can try to bound the even operator, you can try to bound the odd operator. In this talk, I selected a particular result to present, namely to bound the Z2 odd operator. And what we found that there is an upper bound on the lightest Z2 odd operator only when the Z2 is anomalous, but not otherwise. So I can give it analytic explanation for this result, but in this talk I choose to give examples to make it so the example will come later. Here I just present the result. So when the Z2 is anomalous, this is what the numerical bound looks like. So the uh, horizontal axis is the central charge. I'm assuming C left equals to C right. And the vertical axis is the uh, bound on the lightest Z2 odd operator. Delta minus is the scaling dimension of this operator. So the way to uh, read this plot is that you fix a central charge, let's say 6, then for all 1 plus 1D bosonic CFD with the anomalous Z2 global symmetry, the first Z2 odd operators has to be within this range. It cannot be higher. Would it make a difference if you assume that it doesn't answer Uh, I think it makes some little, it doesn't make a sharp <coughs> difference. Originally, we were thinking about keeping that in the paper, but we ended up not, not. And also, in the just a sector, you could also imagine something on weight zero on one side, but you say that doesn't make a difference. It's a yeah. Right? Yeah, I, I cannot remember exactly, but I don't think it makes much difference. 
What's the first question? So, uh, in the conformal bootstrap program, uh, uh, you have to decide what are the operators you, you, you expand on. So, namely, what are the h and h bar in the VR server uh, block, VR server character in composition. So, I showed the VR server character previously in this uh, simple form. <coughs> so, this is not true when h is zero. So when h is 0, there will be an additional 1 minus q factor because of the additional non-state in that virus module. So if you assume there are some conserved currents, namely operators with Spanish in h or h part, then, then uh, the character, we have to use a different character. And that will modify the bootstrap result uh, slightly. So this is the bound, and uh, all these color points, they are some explicit WZW model with anomalous equal global symmetry. These are exactly solvable with WZW model, so you can just compute the light of Z to odd operator in those cases, and you can see that they are all consistent with the bound. And when C is 1, the SU to a level 1 WZW model saturates the bound. In all these examples, is the anomaly also part of the E1? No. Yeah, so um, uh, that would be harder to compute. So the, the ones we look at are uh, are the D2 that are in the center of the uh, WZW. Yeah. Uh, so when C is 1, the uh, bound is 0 0.5. And indeed, in SU2 at level 1, there's a Z2 odd current algebra boundary with H equals to one quarter and H bar equals to one quarter, and that saturates the bound. And you see that there's no plot with the non-anomalous space because there's no bound. And we will give an example <coughs> for why that is the case later. The, this this smell has never It's part of the best we can tell. Yeah. <laughs> now this particular plot, you see, there's not so much features. Uh, there's no kink or whatever. Uh, there's a different bound where we found the uncharged operator versus uh, together with the twisted sector operator. And that plot has some feature. But, but in this talk, I, I think my, my, my philosophy is that I don't really care so much about what the exact number is. I, I actually care about the binary question here, whether there's a bound or not. And you know, anomaly seems to make a, a binary difference. I'm just saying that in the usual module bootstrap, yeah. the spinning bound converges very slowly. Oh, we went to derivative order 19. Uh, uh, well, in the paper, we have the, you know this uh, different derivative order plot. It looks reasonably well. Yeah. It, it, the thing is, you know, when, when, when Scott and you and I yeah. studied that, there's some region which, which we felt has converged actually was far from converging, I see. Uh, which will be recognized. Oh, I see. Uh, might be able to do better. Okay, so why do I think this result is interesting, at least to me? I think there are two perspectives to think about. So first, as a bootstrapper, we know global symmetry is important uh, to input into the uh, bootstrap program to help you target the CFD that you want to bootstrap. For example, in 2 plus 1D, we will bootstrap the old Google model using the old but just saying that a symmetry group is something does not completely specify the kinematic data of the global symmetry. The Hoof anomaly is also uh, an information that would be ideally specified in the bootstrap program. And in this case, that's what we did. We start with a Z2 global symmetry in 1 plus 1D, and we consider the case that it's anomalous or non-anomalous. And we see that even the very existence of a bound might depend on the so I think it's clearly something that would be ideal to, to put in, in any bootstrap program. Second, from the anomaly point of view, if I have an anomaly and I assume the low energy is gap, then anomaly typically implies that the symmetry is either, either spontaneously broken or there is a TQFT of the sense space-time dimension reproducing the anomaly. Um, and there has been a lot of work trying to classify the 
possible thing to FT, uh, or whether the symmetry is not So usually there's a third scenario that the low energy phase is gapless, and there's usually not much we can say. We can just say that, okay, there are some crazy CFT reproducing all the anomaly you see in the But I think this result of ours is telling you that the anomaly actually constrains some uh, CFT data in, in the low energy. And even the discrete anomaly can constrain local operator data in a gapless CFT phase, even though the discrete anomaly doesn't appear in any local operator correlation. Okay, so that's the main result, and now let's move on to some application part. So we were talking about T2, now let's do U1, which from some perspective is easier. So consider U1 global symmetry in 1 plus 1 D quantum field theory, then you have the inertia current with two components, a holomorphic component JD and an anti-holomorphic component J1. Um, in 1 plus 1D, in a unitary compact CFT in 1 plus 1D, we can easily show that J and J bar have to be separately conserved, namely they have to be holomorphic and anti-holomorphic respectively. So sometimes people are tempted to directly, uh, to, to only talk about, to only talk about global symmetry generated by a holomorphic curve. But that's not most general you want global symmetry you can think about. We are allowed to think about a global symmetry with non-vanishing holomorphic and anti-holomorphic uh, current components. We're going to start with that. So I'm not going to assume J or J bar. And I claim that a similar phenomenon happens too. That in a 1 plus 1D of the CFT with U1 global symmetry, you only have a bound on the lightest U1 charge operator when U1 is anomalous, but not otherwise. This is somewhat related to the weak gravity conjecture in ADS3. So in these two papers, the authors uh, derive a bound on the lightest U1 charge operator or a holomorphic U1. That's consistent with the claim in the previous slide because a holomorphic U1 is always anomalous. The anomaly of a holomorphic U1 is captured by the holomorphic level K. So the fact that they got a bound is consistent with the observation that you have a bound when the symmetry is anomalous. However, you can consider more general U1 global symmetries that are not generated by holomorphic current. And generally, there's not going to be a bound for a non anomalous U1 global symmetry. Is there a bound stronger, assuming it's holomorphic? Stronger compared to? Compared to just a bound from the anomaly. I think, well, in those two cases, that's the anomaly of And what do you mean by the second one? Well, so for instance, uh, you could have a theory with holomorphic U1 level K, yeah. and you could compare, you could see if that bound is violated by some other theory with a U1 level K anomaly, but maybe it's U1 K plus N holomorphic and U1 minus N ah. anti holomorphic. Ah, I see. So the only answer is I don't know. We didn't really do a full analysis of the uh, this program for, for such a non holomorphic U1. Yeah. Uh, and the reason I claim that there is a, is a bound is from the spectral field. So I didn't really do the module of this okay. okay, so what's the example that I was having in mind? Um, so just consider C equals to 1, 1 plus 1 D compact boson. There's a radius, uh, which is a, uh, exactly marginal deformation of the one of this compact boson CFT. This is a free theory. And there are always two U1s for any radius. There's a winding U1, and there's a momentum U1. And notice that I'm using the capital U1, meaning that they are compact U1, not R. The winding U1, when acting on a vertex operator with winding number W, give you e to the i w theta. So W is the U1 winding charge of that operator with respect to the U1 winding number. And similarly for the momentum, U1 momentum. Both U1s are non anomalous so individually, uh, they can be gauged, but there's a mixed anomaly between the two. Therefore, if you consider the diagonal U1 of the winding and the momentum, then it's anomalous. 
when you take the radius to be a square root of a rational number, then there are certain integral linear combination of the two u1, such that it's holomorphic. And that holomorphic u1, by definition, will be a number. That's what the And indeed, if you just look at the winding u1, for example, then the lightest charge operator is the lightest winding mode, which has scaling dimension r squared over 2. <coughs> and you can, by making the radius arbitrarily large, the lightest mode just winds around a bigger and bigger circle. And therefore, there's no possible bound on the lightest charge operator with respect to the u1 winding number. That's consistent with the previous observation, because the u1 winding number has no anomaly. So we do not get a bound in this case, and there's no enough. Similarly for the winding, uh, for the momentum number. <laughs> However, if you look at the diagonal U1, then the lightest charge operator is either the lightest winding mode, mode or the lightest KK momentum mode. And the scaling dimension of this operator will be the minimum of these two quantities, which does have an upper bound. Indeed, this diagonal U1 happens. Why, why, why did you emphasize the single D1 and R? Uh, I don't think it makes a huge difference. Okay. It's just that when it's R, I guess I can still talk about that. Yeah, the answer is the same. Yeah, the answer is the same. Yeah. But they are actually you want in contact with some. Yeah, but, uh, but, but the way you derive the bound, you don't actually care. Uh, well, there's a cheap way to get a bound where you do care. The cheap way to get a bound is to use spectral flow. The spectral flow only exists when the uh, group is globally U1, not R. <laughs> so I didn't really do the full modular bootstrap. But if you just want to show the existence of a charge operator, it suffices to do the spectral flow. So the spectral flow is important that it's anomalous and it's a compact one. So this example also you can consider a Z2 subgroup of various U1, and that also explains why when the Z2 is non anomalous we do not get it done. All right, so let's move on to the last part. So you can ask, how much does this correlation between anomaly and bound generalize to other anomalies and other space time dimensions? So to talk about that, we need to um, first uh, discuss a caveat. So, in these space time dimensions, there are some anomaly alpha that cannot be matched by a d dimensional TQFD with a unique low bar. Sometimes it's called a symmetry enforced gaplessness anomaly. Um, notice that this is not an anomaly inflow mechanism. The anomaly inflow tells you that this anomaly in d space time dimension. Uh, it corresponds to a TQFD or SPT in one dimension higher. But here I'm talking about TQFD of the same space-time dimension trying to match the anomaly. So suppose we want to generalize this correlation between anomaly and bounds to more general anomaly. Then we, the first thing we need to make sure is that there's no TQFT with that anomaly. If there were a TQFD with that anomaly, and if the TQFD has a unique global operator, then of course you cannot get any value because that TQFT is an example where there is a unique trivial local operator. You do not have any other charge local operator in the game. They have to make this assumption. So discrete global symmetry in 1 plus 1D is one such example. The, the Z2 anomaly, for example, cannot be matched by 1 plus 1D TQFT. And that's the whole reason that we got about uh, in the previous slides. And this fact just follows from the fact that in 1 plus 1D, the classification of TQFD, of the non-trivial TQFD all have non-trivial local operators. Similarly, you can ask whether this, uh, if, you, if in higher dimension, you have a Z2 or not, does that bound the Z2 odd local operator in your higher dimensional CFD? And the answer is no. That's impossible. Because for any discrete global symmetry in a unitary bosonic quantum field theory higher than <coughs> 1 plus 1d, 
there's always the TQFT matching that amount. This was shown in the paper by Xiaogang Wen, Ju Wen, Wen, and and Adwitten. So this fact that Z2 anomaly bounds local operator is kind of a coincidence in 1 plus 1 D because of the trivialness of 2 D. It will not be generalizable to higher D. However, in other space-time dimension, there are some other in interesting anomalies that cannot be carried by a TQFT of the same space-time dimension. Then we should pay our attention to those anomalies and try to see if there's any possible bound one can derive. So this is what I was just saying, that uh, for such anomaly that cannot be matched by a TQFT, usually called the symmetry for scapelessness. Uh, so for general anomalies, there are three scenarios in the low energy. First, that there is a TQFD with a unique local operator matching the anomaly. Second, is that symmetry is spontaneously broken. Or third, is a capital CFD. And for uh, anomaly that cannot be matched by a TQFD, the first option is known. So what are the examples? The one example, as we were just saying, for any discrete global symmetry in 1 plus 1 D, the anomaly uh, cannot be matched by a 2D TQFD with a unique local operator. Another example would be perturbative anomalies of continuous global symmetry. For example, in 3 plus 1D, if you have a U1 global symmetry, there's a familiar triangle anomaly. That triangle anomaly is an uh, integer value, and that cannot possibly be replaced <coughs> by uh, 3 plus 1D TQFT, because that anomaly will show up as a, uh, as a term in, in, in the current three-point function as separated point. Another example would be we test SU2 anomaly in 3 plus 1D. That's a D2 value anomaly. Uh, so it takes more work to show that it actually cannot be carried by 3 plus 1D TQFT. And that's something that Clay Cordova and Kamaro and Mori are looking at. There are many other uh, anomalies. So today it's kind of reasonable to guess that we, whenever you have such a anomaly that cannot be matched by TQFT, there has to be some bounds on your quantum field theory data. So one direction is clear. If you have a bound, of course the anomaly has to be of that kind. Otherwise, you just I, I just give you the TQFT example, and that would be a counterexample to the bound. But the other direction sounds reasonable, but it will be interesting to see whether it's true, and if it's true, how do we actually get the bound? Namely, whenever you have such an anomaly, is there always an upper bound on the charge of? But uh, in the 1 plus 1D case, it was a bound and a function of central chuck. Yeah, that's right. So, so indeed, the, 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 the conjecture is ambiguous to a certain extent that, <laughs> that you have to fix something and then down the charge operator in terms of those something. And part of the question is to figure out what are those something. Yeah. <laughs> So example, so if you just have anomalies saying 0 plus 1D of some finite group, then that means your Huber space are in the projective representation of that finite group. But then already the ground states are in the projective representation, so you should be able to get charge states. In 1 plus 1D, for the Z2 and the U1 case, uh, that's uh, what we just discussed. So there are some supporting evidence. But there are also some cases that I currently don't know how to get the answer. So for example, in 3 plus 1D, as we just say, a U1 global symmetry can have triangle anomaly that cannot be matched by 3 plus 1D. So is there an upper bound on the lightest U1 charge operator in 3 plus 1D with such an anomaly? Uh, I don't yet know how to get this bound, um, because in the usual couple bootstrap program, if you bootstrap the JJJJ four-point function, you only see charge neutral operator. You don't have access to the charge operator. One potential avenue would be to look at on S3 times S1 partition function of general 3 plus 1. And maybe the anomaly will tell you that there has to be a non-trivial dependence <coughs> of that partition function on the chemical potential one. And another question would be in 3 plus 1D again. If you have an SU2 global symmetry with Witten's anomaly, then does that mean there's a bound on the light that's half into your spin uh, local operator? Because in this case, it's even harder, and I don't really know how to 
get the result. Okay, so let me conclude here, and uh, I'll also say a few words about some other thing we did, but I didn't get a chance to present. So, uh, so the, the talk today is about the weak gravity conjecture question in CFD. That means they're bound on the light discharge operator. And we found that in 1 plus 1D CFD, there's a bound if the symmetry is anomalous, but not otherwise. At least this is true for D2 and D1. And so this is tell, telling us that even the discrete Hubble anomaly, which does not appear in any correlation function of local operators, the discrete anomaly still constrains the local operator spectrum in the upper spaces. Um, and in the remaining two minutes, let me just say a, a few other things that we have done, and I think that are also interesting. So in the fifth part of the talk, I feel like I can just The main bulk of the talk, we talk about bounds on charge operator. But the bootstrap program can also help you <coughs> rounding um, some other sector. But one thing that's <coughs> also interesting is that um, you can you can try to, so for the non-anomalous Z2, as we were saying, there's no bound just on the Z2 charge operator. But there's a bound on this combined sector of Hilbert spaces. So you can look at the direct sum of the Z2 odd operator with the twisted sector operator. There's no bound on each individual sector, but if you look at the lightest operator of the combined sector, then there's a bound. But what, what, what's the meaning of this? So uh, the Z2 odd operators can be taken to be an older operator for second order phase transition. The twisted sector operators are like the disorder operators. So individually, there's no bound on the older operator or the disorder operator. So there's a combined bound. So for example, in the 1 plus 1 DI in CFD, uh, the sigma operator would be the older operator. And then there's a disorder operator that's not a local operator. It lives at the end of the Z2 line, but with the same conformal weight. They're exchanged on the parameters when you follow it. And we can get a bound that looks like this. Uh, so this is a bound on the lightest op operators among the older and the disorder operators. In this case, it's actually saturated by the, this, uh, by the spin and at level 1 of the of the model. Uh, namely, they are the bosonization of the And so this is one other thing we did. And then there's, um, you, you can also try to find the uncharged operator. And what's the significance of that? You can try to bound the D2 uh, even operators. So all the results are scattering by different talks. <laughs> so Although you don't have 30 seconds, I can just show them. So you can also try to bound the Z2 even operators, not the two charge. In this case, you get a bound for both the anomalous and the non-anomalous case. So here, the Z2 is, is non-anomalous. You get an upper bound on the lightest Z2 even scalar operator. So why do I particularly care about a scalar operator in this case? It's because the Z2 even scalar operator would be uh, a relevant deformation of your well, would be would be a perturbation you can add to your CFT that's still preserving the Z2 symmetry. So now you imagine you have some C you have some UV system with some Z2 global symmetry in the UV, and you let it flow. The UV system can be anything. It could be a lattice model. It could be some quantum field theory, or it could be string theory. And you let it flow while preserving the Z2 symmetry. And suppose you want to make a conjecture that in low energy, it hits a uh, CFD fixed point. But then there are some consistency conditions for this to, to be generically true. If the CFT fixed point has some Z2 even relevant deformation, then generically you will miss it because the relevant deformation will drive you away when you flow to the, uh, to the proximity of the fixed point. So for the conjecture to be true without any fine tuning, 
Namely, if you want to have a D2 symmetry protected gapless space without fine tuning, then you better make sure that there's no Z2 even relevant operator at the proposed IRC of D1. So this modular bootstrap can then tell you uh, uh, for what kind of central charge uh, you can hit such a Z2 symmetry protected gapless space without fine tuning. The one result by Xi and Scott and Ian a few years ago is the version without assuming any symmetry. It's just general 1 plus 1 DCFD without assuming any symmetry. And what they show is that when the central charge is smaller than 8, then there's always the relevant deformation operator. And the 8 is saturated by the E8 at level 1 of the Z1. And here we did the Z2 version. So for the non anomalous uh, Z2 symmetry, you can see that this is delta plus is the bound on the Z2 even scalar operator. And this is 2. So for a scalar operator to be a relevant deformation, its scaling dimension has to be smaller than 2. So if you draw the 2 here, you see that when central charge is between 1 and 7.81, all 2D CFD with a non anomalous Z2 it has to have some Z2 even relevant deformation. So there's no Z2 symmetry protected gapless space for non-anomalous Z2 without fine tuning in that range of the central charge. In this case, are you sure that that doesn't actually converge to H? It might. I well, uh, <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, I'm gonna try hard enough. Yeah. <laughs> now for the anomalous Z2, uh, the numbers are nicer. <laughs> uh, the, this, just look at the red curve. The other curves are irrelevant. So you see that the red curve hit the 2 at 7, and then it curves back up at c equals 1. And that's consistent because there are two CFPs that we know at this 2 point, at c equals 1 and c equals 7. So we go that without the D2, without any symmetry, Qi, Ying, and Scott showed that uh, the upper bound is 8, and that's, that was the E8, the level 1 of the DW model. E8 at level 1 does not have, E8 does not have any center. So there's no natural symmetry to talk about. There are, of course, symmetries, but there's no symmetry commuting with the Fermi algebra. And in this anomalous Z2 case, what shows up is the E7 at level 1. And E7 has a center Z2, and when the level is 1, that Z2 is anomalous. Uh, and, and in that case, you can ask, uh, what, what, what is the scaling dimension 2 operator? Well, that's just the, the JJ bar, the current, current bar. So that's the marginal operator. In this case, it's an SU2 at level 1. There's also a center Z2 that's anomalous. And again, the marginal operator is a dimension to JJ bar. And that operator is kind of it's quite famous in high energy physics and condensed matter physics because uh, that's where you start with the O3 model, O3 sigma model. You give UV, it takes theta to be pi, and then let it flow. So this, the symmetry is O3, but actually, if you just have uh, Actually, uh, the, the symmetry is O3, but then it hits the SU2 at level 1 of the GW model. And, and there's a marginal deformation that goes into the SU2 at level 1, and then there's a, there's a marginally irrelevant dire direction going in, and there's a marginally irrelevant direction going in. If you take E6 level 1, where does it sit? Yeah. Well, let me show you. So you can consider. Oh, sorry, it's in the later slide. So E6 has center Z3. So, what happened? Oh, yeah. So you can consider non anomalous C3, and the range of the central charge is 2 to 6, and that's sandwiched between the SU3 and level 1 and 6. And finally, let me just say one more thing that here I talked about Z2 and Z3, and we also did Z4 and Z5. Uh, but you can also consider something even more interesting. So, as we were saying, uh, not all the topological defect lines are associated with with global symmetry. So here we are trying to constrain symmetry-protected gapless spaces. But you can also talk about uh, gapless spaces protected by non-invertible defect. So then you can have a notion of category-protected gapless spaces. And you can also derive a central charge range for those categories. So there's one example you can consider the icing category. So that has three lines. That's the trivial line, the Z2 line, and the duality defect line. There are two uh, categories with the icing fusion, we also let's talk about the one that's realizing icing. 
Then the range of the central charge, like the one here, is sandwiched between the F4 at level 1 and the G2 at level 1. Okay, I think that's enough for today. Thank you. I do have a question. So you talk about the upper bound the scaling dimension of the charge operator. Yeah. And for the C2R, if there's an anomaly, there's a bound. Yeah. And if I, can we think from like this uh, UV completion point of view, say if I have a sound regularization at the DPUV for the CFT, then the anomalous Z2 symmetry means that the, the symmetry cannot be strictly local and outside. So does that point of view help us to think why the charge operator need to be light if the symmetry need to be slightly non-local? Right. If it's uh, anomaly-free, Z2 symmetry means that I can find a regularization such that Z2 symmetry can be strictly right. local. Right. Right. Translation, right. for example, right. it's not on-site. Sometimes translation is not as So another another way to view from putting on latex, so maybe some constraint on the UV UV space. If one formula is from the regularization of the UV, maybe there is also some kind of uh, restriction. What can? So then it would be saying that in that particular case, there are some charge degrees of freedom under the translation. Yeah, maybe maybe the charge operator cannot be too too localized. Need to move in some. Maybe. Yeah, something like that. Like that. Yeah. Can you see something about this spectral flow argument? Oh, right. So the argument is that for U1 global symmetry, I have a topological defect line for every theta. The theta is between 0 and G1. And the topological defect line can end on some point of So let's think of Let's now imagine this uh, thought experiment. So we start with a local operator, actually just an identity operator. That's a trivial local operator. And then if you adiabatically turn on the theta uh, rotation for the one line. So then you get some other operator here that depends on theta. This is not a local operator. It's a point-like operator living at the end of the line. It's conformal weight. And its U1 charge are determined by the spectral flow of both of them. And so there's a formula that depends on theta and depends on the initial uh, conformal weight. In this case, and now you can just keep dialing this theta. But then at some point, you will hit the theta equals to 2 pi uh, uh, line, which is a trivial line. But you get a different operator than the one you started. And this new local operator will have its own h, h bar, and q. And its q will be, these are function of theta, theta, theta. Its q will be uh, 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 some number times k minus k bar, where k and k bar are the holomorphic and anti holomorphic level. Namely, this is the anomaly. So, in other words, if you have a U1 global symmetry with the Kuhoop anomaly, with a non vanishing k minus k bar, then you can generate a charge operator for free. Uh, sorry, I'm confused about this argument. Yeah. You say h and h bar are both determined by something flow. Well, why is that true? Uh, I mean, so, if you just yeah. say you want to be a holomorphic, yeah. uh, you want to say this phi theta is holomorphic, right? Yes. Uh, and that is true. Why? why? So the statement is that whenever you have a holomorphic compact V1 global yeah. symmetry, then the current algebra is necessarily uh, How do you prove that? I'm not, I think one way to from the argument you just gave. Right? I, I think one way to prove that is using modular transformation. So you want the uh, torus partition function with the U1 line to be to have certain modular property, and that would dictate what those twisted sector spectrum should. Say the dimension cannot be shifted. 
the measure has to be what's given by the usual spectral flow for you to have the desired modular properties. Wait, well, what about the non-anomalous non case, right? There, it depends on the radius of the, say, say yes. compact boson, so... Uh, so, for the non-anomalous case, the U1 is necessarily non homomorphic So you get some operator with zero Q. Yeah, so for, for example, let me give point you so Take the C plus one compact boson. There are two non-anomalous U1. We can do spectral flow with respect to each of the non-anomalous U1. If you do the spectral flow with respect to the momentum U1, you shift the operator, you shift the winding number of the operator by one. Vice versa. But there, Sorry, there is no formula for H. But there are two questions. Uh, okay. I, I do understand why you say this follows from modular mirrors of the uh, just the particle function. Uh, can, you, can you elaborate on that? Uh, well, I didn't prepare for it, but I can. Uh, so, yeah, there are two questions. Uh, first, uh, the rough idea is that you want this guy. So now we're talking V of tau, tau bar, and with some um, uh, U1 fugacity. I don't know, maybe link with link with one. And this guy will be related to Thank you. 